Well, as we turn our attention to the Lord's word together today, would you please join with me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are, and we thank you. We thank you so much for the love that you have for each and every one of us. Lord, if you had just created us, it would have been enough. If you had just sustained us, it would have been enough. If you had just even forgiven us of our sins, it would have been enough. And yet, Lord, you've also called us to be your children, given us life, provided us hope, are present with us as we live each and every day, and have promised us an eternity beyond what we could even possibly fathom. And so, Lord, we thank you for all the good things that you've poured out on us. And if we're being honest with ourselves, none of it we deserve. We're not that special. We're not good enough. Lord, there's nothing we could do to earn your love, to earn a place in your kingdom, to undo the wrong things that we've done. We can't fix this world on our own. There's so many things that remind us of just how finite we are. And yet, Lord, you have chosen to love us. And Lord, you love us beyond even our comprehension. And so, Lord, we're humbled by that. We're humbled by your love. And we thank you that in it we find our value. We find our purpose. We find our meaning. Lord, it is true love to be loved by you. And so, Lord, as we gather here together today as a family, we celebrate the love of our Father. We celebrate what our Father has done for us in time and space and human history to redeem us, to demonstrate his love, and to give us hope. And so, Lord, we thank you for these things. And as we turn our attention to your word, as we reflect on what you have done in history to build your church, to expand your kingdom, to prepare this world for Jesus' second coming, Lord, would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds? Would you help us to have deeper understanding? Would you help us to have a deeper appreciation of who you are? And would you inspire us, Lord, to not just celebrate what you've done in history, but to anticipate, to expect you to do it again, for you to continue to do it even here, even in and through us, as you continue to build your kingdom right here in Belle Glade, right here in Florida, right here in the United States and to the ends of the earth. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time. And even more than our edification, we seek your glory. And so, Lord, whether it's what's coming from my mouth up here or the meditation of our hearts and minds, would you please be glorified through all that takes place? We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to start by making a statement that should be fairly obvious to everyone, and it's this, that texts, and by that I mean like books and manuscripts and writing texts, require interpretation. That seems obvious, right? After all, uh, we, we learn reading comprehension in school because we have to work at rightly interpreting texts. We read a difficult passage of scripture and we can get frustrated because the interpretation is not easily coming. We recognize a problem when two people have two very different interpretations of a particular biblical text. Someone's interpretation must be wrong. Texts require interpretation. This is obvious. What might not be obvious is that not just texts, but even events, things that take place, require interpretation. When I was in high school, I received a daily dose of comic relief from one particular teacher who had a rather special way of responding to noise that took place out in the hallway. It didn't matter whether it was a fight that had broken out or two students yelling at one another or just a higher than acceptable volume taking place in the hall. This teacher would stick his head out of the classroom door and shout, what's the meaning of this? It was funny to me anyway. What's the meaning of this? I used to laugh every time I heard this professor. In fact, it didn't matter whether it was in the hall or already sitting in a classroom. He was so loud you could hear it. And I laughed to myself because who talks like that? He did, apparently. However, in looking back, it was a rather appropriate question that he was asking as he shouted out into the hallway. The teacher heard a commotion outside of his classroom. And he probably had a decent idea of what was going on. But he didn't want to jump to the wrong conclusion, a.k.a. make the wrong interpretation. 
Therefore, he needed someone to speak up, to explain what's going on, so that he could rightly understand the situation and so that he could respond appropriately. A few weeks back, I'm sure none of us missed it, was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And so as I do every year, I reflect back on that particular day. And just as probably for all of you, my memories are just as vivid now, 20 years later, as they were the day it happened. I remember I was woken up by my brother-in-law after the first plane hit. I walked out to the living room. I was staring in disbelief at the television screen. And my mind asked the same question that everybody else's uh, mind asked after the first plane hit. What happened? What is going on? Of course, terrorism popped up in my mind as a possibility, but so did accident. Nobody really knew yet. Nobody knew what was going on. The news reporters were, of course, commenting, and they were laying out all of their suggestions of what it could have been, but yet it was an event at that moment without an interpretation. Then the second plane struck, and that's no coincidence. That's no accident. Then the Pentagon, United Airlines Flight 93, and more and more details began to come out, and all of a sudden, the event now had a very real interpretation. Events require interpretation. So when we're thinking about our texts as we've been going through the book of Acts, I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you are a first century Jewish person living in the capital of the Roman Empire. You are from Rome and you have spent a considerable amount of time, energy, and money to travel to Jerusalem for this special festival that you celebrate every year, this culmination of the Feast of Weeks, and you are gonna be at the temple on Pentecost. You've got your day planned out, and as you make your way toward the temple to participate in the events of that day, you hear what sounds like the blowing of a violent wind. You see what could only be described as tongues of fire descending from heaven all around the temple area. Crowds are gathering around to see what on earth is going on. And so, of course, you do, too, as all of this is playing out before you. And a group of people are in the center of all this, and they are just shouting things about God. But here's the weird thing. These men appear to be Galileans, but you, being from Rome, hear them speaking in your own language and in your own dialect. Not only that, but there's a person next to you from Egypt who seems to be claiming the same thing, that he hears them in his language and his dialect. And you look over to another side and there seems to be somebody from the Isle of Crete. And they also seem to hear these people proclaiming the wonders of God in their own language and in their own dialect. What is the meaning of this? What's going on? How do we interpret this event? They must have been asking. And so it's here that we pick up our study in the book of Acts. So please, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And today we are beginning in verse 14. Acts 2, starting in verse 14. And it says this. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Events require interpretation, and this one certainly was no exception. All the people were amazed at what was taking place right before them, but they didn't understand it. 
until Peter stood up and told them. He explained what was going on. And what he explained was no small thing at all. I cannot begin to tell you, by the way, over the past year and a half, just how many Christians have asked me this question. And you know what it is, because you probably asked me this question yourself. Are we living in the end times? Certainly, there are reasons for the sudden shift in everyone's thinking. There's something, there's a reason why so many people start asking me this question, especially in this last two years. We're used to geographically contained problems, right? We've been, many of us have been tuning into the news for years, for decades, for scores of years, perhaps. And we're used to these geographically contained problems, but all of a sudden we're dealing with something that's not contained to a particular geographic region. In fact, it's a, a global situation, a pandemic that's affected people all across the world. For many, if not most people in our nation, this season, over the past year and a half to two years, is the most difficult season they have ever lived through in their entire lives. And I'm not just talking about young people in their 20s or even in their 30s. I'm talking about people even who've lived 70, 80, 90 or more years on the earth. This seems to be the hardest season that most people have faced in their life. Also, there are sweeping changes in our culture that have changed the way that the majority of people view things like truth and morality, things that these were non-negotiables for us not a long time ago, and all of a sudden sweeping changes so that things are hardly recognizable anymore as we look at the world around us. People are polarized, yes, over big issues, but also over small issues, perhaps more so than ever before in the history of our nation. And so what we have are several events, all jammed together, in fact, and we find ourselves desperate to be able to interpret them. What's the meaning of this? From our biblical worldview, we do understand some things that may lead to us asking this question, are we living in the end times? From the Bible, we understand that the end will come. There is an end. There is something out there that's coming. Perhaps this is it. We understand that the world will get worse before the end. We understand that the end will be characterized by sweeping changes, by divisions between people, and a host of other crazy things that, if we're honest, we would choose not to live through if we had the choice. And yet, in our desperation to make sense of what's been happening, to interpret the events that we've experienced, we ask this question often. Are we living in the end times? So here's my answer, because I know you want it. No. But yes, no, but yes, I would make a great politician. No, but yes. So let me explain what I mean by this. I'll start with the no. No, I do not believe that we have entered into the tribulation period or that Jesus is expected to return sometime in the next seven years, although I certainly hope he does. I say this because according to my interpretation of the relevant biblical texts from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are more things that need to take place before those events happen. I'm not moved by recent events to believe that we're living in the end times because if we study history, we plainly see that there have been far worse times. In fact, times that probably more closely resemble the tribulation period, that have already taken place at different points and at different places throughout the world. And while these are certainly difficult times that we live in now, perhaps the most difficult of our generation, far worse times have come and gone in our history, and yet we remain. However, my answer to the question, are we living in the end times, was no, but yes. So what do I mean by yes? And I think our text really helps us to understand this together today. As Peter stood before the people of Jerusalem to explain the events that were taking place in their midst, he said this in Acts 2, starting in 15. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. 
Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. By quoting Joel, Peter was making a rather bold statement. We have entered the last days. In fact, we can see rather clearly that several of the elements from Joel's prophecy were taking place right there in Jerusalem at Pentecost as these people were all gathered there. Uh, Here's just some of them. God's spirit had been poured out. The spirit filled the believers in the sight of all who were there. And so Joel said this would happen and it was happening before them in their very midst. Joel prophesied that the sons and daughters of Israel would prophesy. And here we've seen that these Christ followers, all of which were Jewish at this time, the sons and daughters of Israel, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were proclaiming the wonders of God. They were prophesying before the crowds in the power of the Holy Spirit, just as Joel had prophesied. And as Luke recounts these events in the book of Acts, we don't really see any reference here to visions and dreams. However, you'll see as we continue on in our study of the book of Acts that we will see such events, again, attesting that we have entered the last days. However, as we look at Joel's prophecy, even what, even what Peter references here, there are certain things that hadn't yet taken place. In fact, it's not that they just hadn't taken place then. They didn't take, a place, they didn't take place in and at all throughout the book of Acts. They're not recorded there. And even in the 2,000 years between them and us, some of these things still haven't taken place. For instance, starting in verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And so while the tongues of fire descended from heaven, I get the sense that more will take place in the heavens than was demonstrated here at Pentecost. The sun has not been turned to darkness, nor the moon to blood. That has not happened in the past 2,000 years. And the great and glorious day of the Lord has not yet come. So what are we to make of this? Are we living in the end times? Yes. I mean, no, but yes. If we think about the end times as a spectrum, perhaps as a range of time with a beginning and an end, we're not at the very end, but the period of time has certainly begun. To put it another way, the last days began with Christ's death and resurrection, and the last days will end with the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns. And so we find ourselves somewhere on the timeline between those two points. And so in light of that, I want to draw our attention to some important facts that our study of Acts has thus far revealed. In light of the fact that we are living in the last days, maybe not the last couple of years, but the last days, this season between Christ's first coming and his second coming. As we are here, there's significance to where we are in this timeline compared to other timelines, other times of God working in history. So here's what we've seen in our text. We've already seen that between his resurrection and his ascension, Jesus' primary focus in that 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection was on teaching his followers further about the kingdom of God. He spoke about a lot of important things during his earthly ministry, but he zeroed in on this idea of the kingdom of God. We saw this in Acts 1-3. It says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. In fact, even before his death, Jesus' primary message was the kingdom of God. His miracles that he did demonstrated the power of the kingdom of God. His words and works foreshadowed the kingdom of God and over and over and over. Over again, the Gospels echo Jesus' words to the tune of, The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come near. In fact, Jesus' death and resurrection 
made it possible for people to be rescued from the kingdom of this world into this kingdom of God that Jesus talked so much about. What do I mean by that? Since the fall, all people have been subjects of the kingdom of this world, a kingdom that stands diametrically opposed to the kingdom of God. And yet the Bible is full of promises that one day at the end of time, God will bring his kingdom once again to bear on the earth. All will be made new. Sin and brokenness will be done away with forever. And God will be present with his people and no one any longer will stand opposed to God and his kingdom. All will be well. However, for people to be able to defect from the kingdom of this world unto the kingdom of God, something had to happen. God had to make provision. God had to make that possible. People had to be redeemed. Sin and rebellion had to be paid for. And so Jesus died on the cross to atone for that sin and rebellion so that men and women could become citizens of the kingdom of God. And so what marks this season that we're in, the last days, this period of time that began here in Acts chapter 2 and that will continue until Jesus comes back. What marks this season? The citizens of the kingdom of God serve as ambassadors of the kingdom in the world so that more and more people can become citizens of the kingdom of God. This is our calling. This is what I, this is what the church's mission is as it finds itself on this spectrum between Christ's first and second coming in these last days. And as we saw in Acts 1.8, this was Jesus' instructions to his first disciples. We see this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, God will empower them through his spirit and they will spread the word about the kingdom of God. And this is exactly what was taking place in this scene that we read about in Acts chapter 2. God sent his spirit to empower his people to spread the word about the kingdom of God. Not only was this descriptive of that beginning of the last days from in Acts chapter 2, but this is the way it is for all of God's followers throughout this period of the last days. In fact, this is the way it is for you and for me. If we are disciples of Jesus, then we have received the Holy Spirit. Now, we may not always listen, to, listen for him well. We may not always obey him well. We may not always be conscious of his presence But the fact remains, if we have committed our lives to Christ, if we have surrendered to his lordship, if we belong to him, we have been given. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit who dwells with us always. If we have received the Holy Spirit, then we are empowered to spread the word about the kingdom of God. In other words, each and every one of us, each and every Christ follower has been given all that they need to accomplish the mission that Christ has given to us in these last days. There's another facet of our text today that we ought not to miss, especially in light of our mission. And it's this, verse 20 and 21. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This period of time that Joel and then Peter refer to as the last days will not last forever. This window of time for people to give up their citizenship in the kingdom of this world and to accept citizenship in the kingdom of God, this window will close. In fact, many, even in the New Testament times, expected the end to come a whole lot faster. Uh, In fact, we see this in two places specifically. Uh, In 1 Thessalonians, we see that the Apostle Paul had to write to this church at Thessalonica to explain the way that things would play out so that they would understand it because they had questions and wrong understandings about Jesus' second coming and when it would be. The Apostle Peter addressed the same issue in the book of 2 Peter, his second letter, explaining why God had not yet sent Jesus back. But the fact remains that God will not tarry forever. 
And I know that I reference this passage often, but uh, if often helps us stick permanently in our minds, then good. Um, but the truth of these things is clearly demonstrated in John three sixteen through 18. Here's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And so God sent Jesus because he loved the world and he wanted to redeem the world. He wanted all people to be citizens of the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus didn't come the first time to bring judgment. That doesn't mean he's not coming the second time to bring judgment. But he didn't come the first time in order to bring judgment. That was not the great and glorious day of the Lord that Joel was talking about and many other prophets were talking about. No, Jesus came to lay down his life to redeem people, to save them from the kingdom of this world and to save them into the kingdom of God. Those who believe and are saved uh, are saved from the just penalty of their sins. They're saved from the condemnation that they earned through their own sin and rebellion. They're saved from the kingdom of this world, which will pass away. However, those who do not believe were already condemned because of their sin and rebellion. And by rejecting God's gift, they remain that way. And the day will come when they are called to account for that decision to reject God's grace. How many of you have ever gone to a concert? Raise your hand. Not everybody. I'm surprised by that. Jenny and I love concerts, especially Christian concerts. I have to be honest, we went to a lot more before we had kids. Um, Now, my my oldest didn't like to go to concerts, but our youngest one does. So maybe we'll do that when COVID's over. But there was this one time, it was a painful time. I bought concert tickets for Jenny and me and looked forward to the event. And what ended up happening was the concert was rescheduled. Now, I had it in my day planner back then when the concert was going to be the first time. When they rescheduled it, I failed to put it in there. The tickets got tucked safely in a drawer somewhere. And little did I know the day of the concert came and went. And I didn't realize till a while after the concert when I found the tickets. And no, we missed the concert. Now, I had the tickets. I would be able to gain entrance. I would be able to be a part of the event because I had the ticket, but I didn't avail myself of it. And so I missed it. I did not have an opportunity to enjoy the blessing of being at the concert because I did not take advantage of the ticket that I had. God has given every man and woman the ticket. Jesus' death on the cross made provision for every single human being to attend. However, if they don't avail themselves of it before the end, they will miss it. Yet the beautiful promise in our text today is this in verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is God's desire. This is God's heart. This is God's will. This is why Jesus was sent. And God will make good on his promise that those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. In fact, this is an Old Testament promise in Joel, and we see it reiterated here by Peter, and it's grabbed hold of by Paul, and he demonstrates that the the person that, that was being prophesied about the Lord is Jesus. We see this in Romans 10, 9 through 13. Hear these words says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if we would just declare with our mouth what is true of our hearts and minds, that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord We will be saved for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Friends, we find ourselves in one of two camps, whether we thought about it or not. And our passage today has implications for us regardless of which camp we're in. If we've not yet committed our lives to Jesus, if we've not yet called upon his name, if we've not yet surrendered to him as Lord, if we've not yet received his gift of salvation, we better not put this off. It's easy to think that we've been in the last days for 2,000 years, so surely I have some more time to wait. There's more time to get serious with God. However, the truth of the matter is that we're not promised even another minute on this earth. If anything, this is one of the lessons we've learned the hard way over this past year and a half to two years. Life is fleeting. So if you recognize the truth of the gospel, but you've not yet responded to it, I would urge you don't wait any longer. If you're not sure whether or not that this is true, you owe it to yourself to investigate the matter and to do it sooner rather than later. And even if you're convinced that this is not true, I would urge you to take another honest look with how much is at stake here. One way or the other, the window will close, and God has done all that he can to provide salvation to everybody. And if we don't have it, that's on us. If we're in the other camp, as one of those who has committed their lives to the Lord, then this passage also has some very specific and important implications for us as well. Again, God has demonstrated that he keeps his promises. And so he will also keep his promises of coming again and bringing the the end to these last days. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost just as he had promised, and Christians then and now have been empowered to serve as Christ's witnesses in the world during these last days. We are to serve as ambassadors, representative of the kingdom of God to those who are part of the kingdom of this world, which is passing away. You know, over my life, and you could ask Jenny, she could attest to this with stories that are worse than you could probably imagine, but I have worked a lot of jobs. I've worked for all kinds of bosses, and it just seems like the majority of the bosses I've worked for have been horrible bosses. Raise your hand if you've ever worked for a horrible boss. Don't worry, the camera's not pointed at you, so if they're watching, they won't know. Um, Yeah, I've worked for some horrible bosses. I've worked for bosses that were so bad, in fact, that the only reason I worked hard and did well at my job was because I had a good work ethic. If I didn't have a good work ethic, they gave me no reason to work hard on their behalf. I certainly wasn't working hard and well to please them, Uh, They did not deserve my respect in the least. Now, thankfully, that hasn't been all of the bosses I've worked for. I've worked for some wonderful bosses as well. Those who did deserve my respect. Uh, Those who led by example. Those who were kind. Those who inspired others to be the best version of themselves. And I found myself in those seasons, in those jobs, under those bosses, working even harder. Working even better. Because I not only wanted to do well at my job, I wanted to make my boss look good. I wanted to please my boss because they deserved it because they, did, they put in just as much effort as they inspired in me. So when we think about the king of the kingdom of God, when we think about our ultimate boss, he should inspire us to give our very best for him. Uh, shouldn't we desire to give our very best in everything that he has called us to do? If God has appointed us as his ambassadors and if he has empowered us for this task, we must do our best for him. And so when you couple that with the fact that those who are apart from him are on a sinking ship and are desperately in need of salvation, aren't we moved to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom even harder to them in this world? Friends, if we are Christ followers, we must take seriously the commission that we've been given by our King for God's glory, for King Jesus, for the salvation of the lost. So help us, God. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that as you have moved and worked in history, bringing things about for your purposes, ultimately to bring in the culmination of history and usher in your kingdom, Lord, you have made every provision that we would be there. You have given your very son to die on the cross to atone for our sin, to redeem us, to reconcile us, to rescue us from the kingdom of this world unto the kingdom of God that we would not miss the show. 
Lord, there are many out there who the ticket is being offered to them, and yet they have not yet acquired it. They have not yet reached out for it. They have not yet accepted it. And yet, Lord, you offer it and you desire for them to take it and you desire for them to be saved and to be your child and to be forgiven, to be redeemed and to have life and hope forever. And Lord, you have commissioned us, your church, your people, those who have been redeemed to serve as your ambassadors to them, that they might hear and respond to the gospel. And Lord, I confess that myself and probably a large percentage of our church family here have not been found faithful with this responsibility that you've entrusted to us. And so, Lord, we confess that to you. And, Lord, we repent of that. And, Lord, we ask that you would lead us in being faithful, faithful ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Give us the words to say. Lord, fill us with a desire, a need, a hunger for your word, that we would read it and understand it and be able to proclaim your truth to articulate the gospel well to those who need to hear it. Help us, O Lord, to be sensitive to uh, the best ways to reach certain people. Help us to be listeners as well as speakers. Help us, Lord, to have a heart that breaks for people who are close to us and yet far from you. Lord, provide opportunities. And Lord, convict our hearts in those moments that we see the opportunities plainly before us. And Lord, may we be filled with joy as we watch you work in and through us to transform lives in our midst. May we gather together in this place to celebrate all that you've done between Sunday and Sunday. Because Lord, we are not just your church from 11 to 12 on Sunday morning. We are your church every day and in every place that you lead us. May we live that way for your honor and glory. We thank you in Jesus' name.